Let me uh, begin by gratefully acknowledging the loving, abiding presence, the ground and source of life, whom I know as God. I too want to thank Sarah Owsley and the Festival of Faith's family. And on behalf of our president, Tori McClure, the university's uh, Spalding University, where we are striving to be a diverse community of learners grounded in spiritual values and promoting peace and justice. And on behalf of my co-presenter, Dr. Alton Pollard and panelists Ferguson and Bussey, we thank each of you for joining us in this exploration of faith and race. Relative to this topic, it is my honor to share with you a few thoughts about truth and its relevance to us as individuals. I'll start with a personal story. The second Sunday of my freshman year at the recently integrated South Carolina College was very different than the first Sunday. The first Sunday, as was the long-standing tradition, all of the freshmen lined up to go to church. White students walked to the neighborhood church, while black students boarded a bus to go across town. The second Sunday, not the first, the second Sunday, there were no crowds there were no buses. I was there alone. I had promised my parents I would go to church. But I decided, though I was alone, I would not let that stop me. In my Sunday best, with purse and Bible in hand, I decided to walk to one of the white churches. After all, I reasoned, since the schools had become integrated, surely, the churches would be too. I figured the only reason we black students were provided busing on the first Sunday was so we could enjoy a more familiar black church worship experience. Hmm, yeah, I know. As I approached the church, I noticed several people looking quizzically at me and whispering. Perhaps it was not going to go as I had expected, but I gathered my nerve and I continued on up the stairs to the church where two male ushers stood. Seeing me, one of them simply said, yes, as if to say, what do you want? Uh, good morning, I'm here for the worship service, I said, sounding more bravely more brave than I felt. He whispered loudly to the usher standing near him, loudly enough for me to hear, what are we going to do with her? It was a moment of truth. This moment of truth took place in the 70s. The faith communities today face the same question. When I recall stories of black members of predominantly church, white churches, their disappointment and despair with their church's feeble responses or total indifference to months of protests against racial injustice, I hear the loud whisper echoed, what are we going to do with them? A moment of truth. Howard Thurman, the visionary for our time that you've just heard, describes a moment of truth as the point of naked exposure to a solitary question of ultimate significance. A moment that has a bearing on the kind of human being a person or society is. A moment on the ground 
of our self-respect. The journey to racial equity and justice is paved with moments of truth. Truth defined as reality as contrasted with imagination or mere appearance. Truths are based on facts and can be reliably uh, agreed on as the foundation for making decisions and taking actions. Repair, to make right or to put right. Truth, repair, what matters most? In one of the anti-racist training programs we offer at Spalding University, we explore a question that I invite you to ponder. What is most important to you when you have been harmed? Truth or repair? We follow up with the second question. What is most important to you when you have caused the harm? Truth or repair? Almost always, participants in the training respond that when they have caused the harm, the next best thing to do is get on with repair. Guilt, shame, and the need to be seen as a good person and a fretful urgency to just move on generally will lead us to respond in one of two ways when we have caused the harm. First, we are determined to explain our intent. If you just understood why it is this way, if you just understood why I did what I did, we could move on. As if our intent excuses the negative impact that we have had on the other person. If focusing on our intent doesn't do the work, we seek quick solutions. Such solutions are temporary and do little, if anything, to repair the harm done to others since the real purpose is to relieve the pressure on ourselves. Focus on intent or rush to repair. In either case, the truth gets diminished or ignored altogether. Many forces get in the way of truth. For instance, self-image. As people of faith, we are very well acquainted with the idea that special spiritual disciplines impact how we behave and what we do. We know the significance of developing spiritual disciplines that support work of social justice. What we may forget is the reverse is also true. What we do impacts who we are. We may think of ourselves in a particular way as fair, just, and not realize how much our repeated behaviors, such as turning a blind eye to injustice or ignoring racist behaviors of others, have altered who we really are. We think we are fair and just. Our behaviors reveal we are not. The truth doesn't match our self-image. Now to this point, I've been talking about those who have caused harm. Conversely, those who have been harmed recognize that to choose between truth and repair is a false choice. They realize truth and repair are intertwined and interdependent. Without truth, you see, it becomes easy to feign ignorance and sanction the status quo. The few changes that are made in repair are shallow and ineffective. And there's no or very little conviction to stay the course for equity and justice. Without truth, there is no real freedom. We are imprisoned by fear and lies 
told to keep truth at bay. Truth helps us to understand what needs to be repaired, who needs to be involved in the repair, the re depth of the repair that is needed, what repairs are likely to be superficial and which repairs are likely to have a sustainable impact. Of course, if we only focus on truth telling, nothing gets done. There is no repairing of harm and temporary solutions will soon yield resentment and bitterness, especially as the harms are repeated. Truth and repair, both are essential on the journey to racial justice and equity. But let us not forget another essential force in the equation, grace. Grace is locating a person where they are and treating them as if they are where they ought to be. Righteous grace frees us to locate and face our fears and the truth. Grace helps us to see our shared humanity. Grace makes it possible to feel cared for and to care for others. Grace and truth make real repair possible. Beloved communities of faith, our moment of truth stands before us demanding an answer. What are we going to do with people in communities who are oppressed by racism? And I don't mean what are we going to do about them, I mean, what are we going to do together with them? Prior responses to this question have been numerous and lacking. If we are to be true to our faith traditions and sacred commitments that compel us to love, each of us must decide not just what would be nice to do or what we ought to do, we must decide what we will do to dismantle brick by brick systems of sustained racism. We cannot continue to trudge along the path described by John Moser where those who are not directly impacted by injustice can go about their lives without seeing the threat. Those who are suffering are just too busy trying to survive to make a difference and do much about it. We cannot continue this current path and truly claim allegiance to our faith traditions, our deity, our God, and our righteous moral guides that command us to do to others as they would, we would have them do to us. And while they are important, we cannot merely point to institutions. We, individuals, make up institutions and policies. So let us respond to the moment of truth as it asks, who will you be and what more are you going to do? In closing, I look again to Howard Thurman, who invites us to find that which is big enough to draw us away from artificial and ineffective methods, to take the view that is large enough to release in us the vast courage capable of sustaining us in the long pull toward a valid increase in welfare and well-being, equity and justice for all. Let us pray that this will be our response to our moments of truth. And now I'd like to uh, do a handoff to our co-presenter, Reverend Dr. Alton Pollard, or Alton, as we finally say, to speak to you about repair. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. 
And thank you to everyone who is participant in this year's Festival of Faiths. Our subject matter is of critical importance for our day and time, addressing issues of faith and racism. And today in this session, Truth and Repair, I would like to begin with these reflections that should be familiar to some of us and perhaps for others of us heard the very first time. I am not sad that black Americans are rebelling. This was not only inevitable, but imminently desirable. Without this magnificent ferment among black folk, the old evasions and procrastinations would have continued indefinitely. Black people have slammed the door shut on a past of deafening passivity. Except for the Reconstruction years, they have never in their long history on American soil struggled with such creativity and courage for their freedom. These are our bright years of emergence. Though they are painful ones, they cannot be avoided. In these trying circumstances, the black revolution is much more than a struggle for black rights. It is forcing America to face all its interrelated flaws. It is exposing the evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. Today's dissenters tell the complacent majority that the time has come when further evasion of social responsibility in a turbulent world will court disaster and death. America has not yet changed because so many think it need not change. But this is the illusion of the damned. America must change because its millions of black citizens will no longer live supinely in a wretched past. They have left the valley of despair. They have found strength in struggle. Joined by white allies, they will shake the prison walls until they fall. America must change. The time has come for America to change. It is the time for our repair. The radical reconstruction of society that Martin Luther King wrote about in the weeks before his assassination 53 years ago. He wrote these words as a love letter to his country, as a testament of hope, even in a deeply broken society, a society convulsing within, tortured without, unable to come to terms with itself, with the unsparing truth of who we have been and are. We are a nation born in violence, and racism is our original sin, a virus, a sickness that festers still. Racism is part of our ideological composition and materialist makeup, mocking the nation's self-professed democratic ideals. With aspirations of who we are yet unmet, promissory notes, still unpaid, and the foundational sin of racism all but permanent. There is no road to redemption, recovery, restoration, renewal, in some repair, without our first telling the truth, as Chandra has noted. And once having told the truth about who we are and how we have come to where we are, to tell the truth, 
again and again and again. There are no adequate apologies to be made for what has happened in our past, but only the practice of freedom is what we seek. A freedom that is personal and corporate, individual and collective, that leads to, as Martin said, the radical reconstruction of our society. King's words remind us there are terrible continuities between the present and the past. In some cases, it is very much the case that the past is not yet past. The history of America is filled with racism. It is a racism of fundamental significance that haunts our nation. As we have heard, these ghosts that continue to ravage our national psyche and trample our society's yearning to breathe free. Through it all, black America challenges our untruths and gives shape to new meanings of life for people of African descent and for all persons who yearn to breathe free in this land. Police brutality, vigilante injustice, mass incarceration, massive wealth gaps, housing discrimination, and the denigrating of black and brown bodies in every way possible is our nation's truth. Rank hierarchy and raw power have decimated entire groups of people in our land by reason of ethnicity, language, region, gender, sexuality, re religion, ability, and more. And this is all a part of our triumphalist story that we do not tell. Until we tell the truth, our land cannot know peace. Truth telling and repair begins at home. Over these three days, you have heard about the reckoning that is before us. We already knew it before the Festival of Faith arrived, but the role for good and ill that religion has played has not always been told so well. Our city and state can rectify cities' centuries of disenfranchisement by doing some very basic things. For example, register every young black person eligible to vote when they are of voting age at 18. This is not a difficult thing to do, and yet it has become utterly impossible in our society. We can challenge systemic educational inequities by covering tuition costs for our long history of exclusionary practices. Banks, businesses, large and small, higher education, the military, governments, local and federal, all of whom have invested in and benefited from racism. And that means pretty much everybody. All of us have this responsibility. While we fidget and wonder what it is that we can do to make our city of Louisville better, we flounder. Louisville cannot prosper until the West End flourishes. The nation cannot prosper until all of us flourish. In the wise African saying, I am because we are. Louisville deserves our best in creating new landscapes and seeing new worlds. And I regret that I am not there with you physically, but I am so glad to be with you virtually. Our world and city have been shattered by a racism, injustice, inequity, violence, discrimination, and death spiral. There is something better waiting for us in our personal and collective lives. As a people of faith, this is our witness. I invite our audience along with Chandra to consider whether you are live streaming or in person, to consider what will you do over this next hour and beyond of our time. In the name of truth, repair, justice, and love, what will you do to change our city? If you believe in truth and repair, then prepare to be discomforted by what you learn. 
if you believe in love and justice, then expect to be inconvenienced because people have been inconvenienced for countless centuries in the name of discrimination, bigotry, and racism. And if you want to see we the people become reality, then there is no recourse than a deep commitment. If we are prepared to do this, we will experience the beauty of our shared humanity together. And so I have invited two of our sisters in this struggle of holistic repair to discuss the power we possess in liberating Louisville and we ourselves. Stachel Bussey and James Seda Ferguson are two among the many exemplars in West, the West End and beyond who have demonstrated the capacity and courage we must have if our souls will survive. And so I will now turn to a brief introduction of these two and then invite them into our conversation. Stachel Bussey began serving in the church at age seven. The self-taught musician became a minister of music at age 22, then returned to her alma mater, Central High School, as assistant band director. In 2015, she was named worship director for One Church Louisville, and in 2017, she answered the call to minister from the pulpit. Stachel founded Hope Bus, a nonprofit that has provided rides to the polls, hosted conversations on mental health, and following the murders of Breonna Taylor and David McAtee, provided free food and gospel music to the community. Stachel earned her Master of Divinity from that esteemed institution called Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary and serves on Vanderbilt's Racial Justice Collaborative Cohort. The Reverend Dr. James Edda Ferguson it's senior pastor of St. Peter's United Church of Christ in Louisville, where she leads the church's vision to cultivate seeds of necessity through spiritual guidance and community partnerships. In her 2016 book, Urban Ministry, Revitalizing a Church and Impacting a Community, Ferguson outlines her program that helps ease re-entry using Christian principles, intentional nurturing, accountability, and mentoring. Under Ferguson's leadership, the Molo Village Community Development Corporation was established to engage Russell residents in holistic approaches to community development. Ferguson earned a Master of Education from the University of Louisville and a Master of Divinity and Doctor of Ministry from the Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary where she is now an adjunct instructor. And so colleagues, Stachel and James Etta, I turn to you to offer questions and invite your brief comments. The first question is this to you both. You are natives of Louisville and the West End specifically. In a few sentences, what makes the West End and your neighborhood especially, as well as the West End overall, what makes the West End a special community in which to live and work? You want to go first? You want to go first? Stay <laughs> shell. Stay shell. And then James you Adam. Thank you, Dr. Pollard. Um, what makes it special, I guess, is two people right here sitting here who are in it, who are from it. But the Western of Louisville um, is what I think, what I would call probably the most resilient community in this city. Um, it's probably the largest, and I don't know if many of you know, 
but it, it's nine neighborhoods that make up what they call the West End. Really, when you cross the West Side of Knife, they say you're coming on to the West Side. What I've seen, um, especially in, in, in the ways that our city has almost tore it apart, and I promised Dr. Pollard I'd behave, so I promise y'all I'm gonna try my best. <laughs> but I've seen such a resilience. Those people, our people, us, we've been displaced. Our neighborhoods and communities have been gentrified. We don't have any grocery stores. We don't have a lot of shopping centers. There's not many job opportunities. And somehow, some way, we are people who are still surviving. Mm. And we, um, when you think of, of this community of, of achievers and believers, you, we've, we've lived through some stuff. We've lived through chemical plants being in our neighborhoods. We, we've survived these things, having skin conditions because of the toxicity in our, in our environment. We, we survive when our schools are not doing so well. We survive when our education hasn't been so quality. We survive when we gotta go to convenience stores because that's what we have when, and the bread might be stale. We survive off Vienna sausages and stuff because that's what we can afford. And somehow, some way, our grannies and stuff, they be living to be 95. You know, and they was cooking chicken with lard and shortening <laughs> and hot water cornbread. And if some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about, y'all need to come sit with me for Thanksgiving. All right. But, this, but it's such a resilient community. Um, and so that's why I think it's a special place to be, because after everything that's been done to us, we are still standing. Hmm. Amen. All right. Speak truth, my sister. James Etta. Well, Dr. Pollard, uh, I agree with Stacia. Uh, it is a resilient people yeah. in Russell. Um, I had the benefit of, of spending many of my uh, youth in Russell, and the people are resilient uh, be, yeah. uh, beyond all odds um, against them. Uh, when you are in a community where people uh, will say to you, the biggest expectation for us is for us to fail. And, and you hear that and you know that um, they are resilient and they res are ready to go on and love on no matter what. Um, they love hard, uh, they care for one another. Uh, there is a misconception in the West End that people don't care about one another, but they care about one another and they uh, help uh, each other. And they are uh, a resilient people uh, ready to uh, just uh, achieve the same uh, thing that everyone else uh, in Louisville uh, wants to achieve and has the ability uh, to achieve. So uh, resilience and ability to love beyond um, um, what is afforded to them. Thank you, James Etta. And let me just say, as we go into these questions, how much of an honor it is for me to uh, be participating in this session with all three of our sisters on this panel co-moderating with uh, Chandra and to be here with James Etta and Shell. I'm so very proud to know all of them. And I know for those of you who are meeting them for the very first time, uh, you are equally feeling the burn of what they uh, are bringing to us this morning. The next question um, speaks, I think, equally directly to uh, you, James Etta, and Stacia. Um, and I would ask you to take a little time and talk about one thing that has best prepared you to meet the challenges of anti-racist repair. Describe your own contributions to transformation in our city. And, uh, James, if you'd like to start this time and then we'll come to Seychelles. I began uh, my work as um, pastor at St. Peter's United Church of Christ in 2006. 
And at that time when I and my husband arrived there, there were 15 German descendant senior adults there. And when uh, my husband and I walked through the door, one person uh, got up and left and said, I'm not gonna worship with people that look like you. And, mm. and that could have dealt a, a, a blow where I would have stopped uh, doing ministry, but as a result of that, um, I used that as an opportunity to open the doors of the church so that people that looked like me could come in and began to worship. It, it was an opportunity for those 14 remaining senior adults to understand that uh, these were real people. All they had ever read about and seen was uh, what they had seen on the news or read in the newspaper. And so there was a lot of fear and a lot of concern about um, integrating uh, the church. And so we began to have those sacred conversations, those conversations that said, we're more alike than we are different. Those conversations that said that uh, uh, this is the church, this is the responsibility of the church uh, to, to reach uh, the people who are hurting, those people who uh, have been oppressed, those people that are in need. And, and so transformation began, uh, Dr. Paula, when we opened the doors and began to recognize that we could make a difference in our community. And I think that is something that is needed uh, all across uh, Jefferson County. That's what is needed all across um, uh, the United States uh, for us to open those doors and to break down those constructed barriers and boundaries that keep us separated. And it begins with uh, dealing with uh, uh, dealing through uh, communication, but it also uh, means that we've got to be truth tellers yeah. and begin to understand that those constructed barriers are, is what is keeping us uh, divided and from being able to become uh, who God has called us to be. Thank you, thank you. Stage show. I was going to ask you to ask the question again, but I think I got it. <laughs> you got it? <laughs> I think so. Okay. I, I think I've had several moments, but I think one in particular that I, I can remember, and this one I was at the prestigious universe, uh, seminary. Um, I remember in 20... Okay, it, was, it wasn't when I didn't think I couldn't pass Hebrew because that was, that was rough. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had a moment there too. But I think it was 2019 when I thought, um, I was like, this, this cannot be it. I was probably at the lowest I could be. And um, for maybe 40 something days, I couldn't eat solid food. Like all of a sudden something happened to my stomach, right? And I was like, who is this God that, like, grandma and them, because that ain't working for me right now. And um, I remember having to take my J-term class in and out of hospital, uh. going back and forth, you know, being very, very nervous about, like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to get kicked out of school. You know, I had just these weird things happening, but it was the one moment that I remember after that when I remember one thing from, from, that, from, that, from those 40 days. I remember, I, I was taking my class and I remember that Dr. Justin Reed now um, talked about the rise of, of prophets and kingship at the same time. Then, that's, that's all I remember too from the hospital, <laughs> but it was that semester that followed that, being in Dr. Mumford's class, reading a book by um, Dr. Marvin McMickle called Where Have All the Prophets Gone? Something shook in me. I read the book in two days. I, I, for real, I did. But what it said was the response to our, our world um, is the voice of the prophet. And I got to be very, very clear because 
The only thing I knew about prophecy at that point was like, if you give $10, you should get 1000 And that was kind of weird, but that's the only thing I knew. But what, it, what he talked about was, was the remnant, that the, that, that the voice of the prophet would be the response to a culture or a community in crisis. Mm -hmm. What we couldn't do, and he, in this book, he talked about how um, people who do, do things like God in America, like there's no... There's no God and nothing. It's just God. And he talked about in these things where we get in our churches and we get so comfortable. Then we start praising our praise in our cute buildings. But when we leave, we leave and go into communities that are war zones. And that was some kind of reckoning in me that said, first of all, it taught me that I wasn't crazy because I knew something was wrong. I knew something was wrong, like growing up in the West End, being poor. But it was only seemed like this prosperity was working for one person. Like... We would give everything we had to the church, but then we would go home and wouldn't have our basic needs. Mm -hmm. Like something mm -hmm. was wrong with that. So I was 15 years old when I thought something was wrong. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. reckoning was years later when I, when, when I read that book and I said, oh my goodness, I don't feel as crazy anymore. What I then decided that I was going to take the call of being the remnant, the prophetic voice mm -hmm. that literally would disrupt every single system that was keeping people oppressed. And so that was kind of my moment of, somebody snapping to something. <laughs> man, that, man. You know, it's okay. but, right. but those, are, those are the moments. And then if I could say that one thing led me to the big thing last year, it wasn't those people in the protests, it was us. Uh -huh. And I was on the front with them every single day and I wouldn't have been anywhere else and so that was kind of, you said one thing, but I had to kind of take you through that so you can know my journey, Dr. Pollard, as if you didn't know, but they didn't know. Hey. It, so. Amen. <laughs> so it is one thing. Thank, thank you, Stacey and James. It, it is one thing. Um, our life has moments, but yeah. those moments add up to one thing. So thank you for mm -hmm. uh, expounding eloquently, um, Stacey. Yes. This question um, is one that I think speaks um, broadly um, to our audience as well as to um, our panelists. Stacia, I'll begin with you on this one. Describe how churches and the faith community, the temple, the mosque, the synagogue, um, as well as other houses of worship, describe how the faith community within and beyond the West End is making a difference there. I am, um, I recently, well, maybe for the last four, five months, I have been the kind of community chaplain network coordinator working alongside Judd Hendricks at Interfaith Past the Peace. And um, sometimes as sad as I am by how the church responds, I am absolutely proud of how the, the church and other faith leaders and other faith communities have responded to this crisis. If nothing else, I think it moved us from safe conversations to honest ones. And I think it's, it's probably very, very hard sitting in something like this, but it's making us have intentional interactions. It's making us be intentional about our conversation. It's making us not be as safe anymore. It's making us ask questions before we tell somebody you pretty for a black girl. It's making us say things, it's making us recognize who, and I, who, we, who we've been and who we are. And I think our, our community, our faith community, all of our faith leaders, um, from, from the Buddhist to the Jew, from the Christian to the, like I, I think we have all just said we are going to be intentional about having real honest con conversations but also going a step further and going to have relationships, because that means something. It's, it's the same thing will happen if we just said, okay, we know it's there, but we did nothing about it. The same thing will happen if we knew we, we were in a racial reckoning and people say, okay, but then we're still gonna have a panel and it's not gonna include women or, or black people. But what I, think, what I think the faith community as a whole has done and is doing and trying to do most of us anyway, some people probably not, but most of us, I think, are responding in a way that says we can no longer be the same way we are. And that's just not for white people. That's for black people, too. Us looking at our complacency of captivity, 
right? Some of us are, have just been complacent. Some of us have been complacent in our captivity, have been complacent in our code switching, have been complacent when we walk past a white person just to move because that's what we've been taught. And so some of us mm. have been complacent in our captivity. Some of us have been complacent in our capitalism and how we benefit from it. Other, other of us have been complacent in our comfortability, mm. right? And so I think this moment has given us all a chance to respond. And I think for the most part, we're doing it well. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Stacia. James Evans? I think that as um, faith communities in the West End yeah. and all around Louisville, we are getting better. Yeah. <clears throat> We're beginning to have that dialogue so that, excuse me, thank you. We're beginning to have that dialogue where we're able to um, communicate with one another about what is needed to be changed. For me, faith is an action word. I think I heard uh, Dean uh, Bradley say that the other day. And so many times what we have done in our churches, we've talked about um, what needs to be done, but we have not uh, put that into action. And so we're beginning uh, to see more of our faith communities uh, in the West End work together, not in competition with one another, because sometimes we're so busy being competitive where we're trying to get that membership or those yeah. tithes and offering that we forget what the real work is for us to do. And that is to uh, help one another, help those in our community, help those who are oppressed, help those that uh, need a hand up and not just a hand out, help yeah. Uh, to, to live um, uh, the gospel in a way that is going to make a tangible difference in the people that we serve. And so we're beginning to see more of that. But we also know that we don't have uh, the resources in the African American community yeah. to do that hard work, to do some of that justice work, to yeah. do some of that economic development, to do those things. And so we need our brothers and sisters uh, all on the, in the other faith communities to step up mm -hmm. uh, to work with us, not to, not to uh, uh, law it over us, yeah. but to work with us in doing that um, uh, difficult work in our community. So the faith communities are uh, beginning to make a difference. Uh, and as uh, Stacia, you, uh, you said, not just uh, white faith communities, Us. but black mm -hmm. uh, faith communities as well. All of us coming together on one accord, realizing that um, there's much work for all of us to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I hear um, intimations of considerable hope in the uh, responses that you have just given, and um, that is indeed gratifying to hear. I would um, also say that um, even with those intimations of hope, um, we still have a lot more um, work that lies um, mm -hmm. before us. And, and that leads to this question, what changes need to be made to work toward ending racism in Louisville? Not just the West End, but Louisville. Um, and uh, if you'd like to address this part of the question, what black Louisville needs to, bring, uh, needs to bring about repair, please feel free to do so. But certainly the most important uh, part of that question is about what is the city um, what changes need to be ha happening here. Uh, and with our mayor present, I'm sure that uh, uh, he will be all ears among all the rest of us. Oh, wow. um, Stachel, you want to start off with that one? Whew. Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so loaded. I, um, I, I get to see things differently because um, somehow I have became the exception for my community and they trust me. Right, so when I leave y'all, I gotta go back home and they probably watching, so I gotta make sure I'm careful because they'll be knocking on my door. 
But, <laughs> but what I, I'll, I'll be honest, um, careful but honest. Uh -huh. There were people who were walking, marching alongside me in that protest who were still fighting charges, using every resource they have. 200 something people are still fighting charges because they stood up for something. We get to have yes. conversations while they get to be convicted felons. Mm. Come and on that's now. the stuff that, yes. that hangs on my shoulders, right? And I think the leadership in the city had, had a huge reckoning, right? And did some things, right? And, and, and I don't know if many of you saw, don't go back and watch the tape, but it was hard getting on the civilian review board. But, and, and I accept the, res the responsibility, and, and our city is making changes, but in, in, in a way, people are still paying for things that people are profiting off of, right? People are, are on house arrest for rioting charges when they were standing next to me. People are, on, people are locked up fighting charges right now. So the first thing the city of Louisville could do mm. is probably drop the charges against the people who are the very reason we're in here right now. The, the second thing that this city needs to do, all, all 81 of the cities within the city, is to begin to have these conversations that are cross um, communities. White churches need to be talking to black churches. Black churches need to be talking to white churches. People need to be going to, to temples. People need to be going to, to mosques. We need to be having real conversations because I think God in whatever form is, 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 is excited about a humanity that works together that is about communal justice, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. right? Mm -hmm. And so we have got to have conversations that don't just end in conversations, but begin in, 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 in action. I, and I said this, somebody asked me yesterday, I deal with a weird tension because people are very, very um, in speech and in in presentation are very, very liberation, are very, very, let's be together. But people can't seem to take that presentation mm. and make it practical. Mm. You cannot cry liberation, but then when you leave here, you don't ever take a drive to the West End. You can't understand it. You cannot, you cannot say we want to be these things. And that's the thing with our community. And Louisville, what, is the fourth most segregated city in, in the nation? That's real, mm. right? And that, that, that's, that's an that's a honest, statistic and you want to know why because I can take we can leave here we can drive together and I will take you to where all our most of the poor people are they're going to be they're going to be condensed in one group and we can drive and it's going to be wide and that's what they call the west and the Louisville. that's where all the poor people are now okay I'm saying all that's where 90% of the poor people are those people are living at the poverty level or below it you're talking about what, 40,000 people, or, or however many people live in these nine to 10 communities, right? And, 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 and suffering for violence, right? And the symptoms that it, the, what racism has done to us. Now we are all living in a city where we feel unsafe. And what we have to do as a city, as a church community, as faith leaders, is we have to stop being reactive and start being proactive. Mm -hmm. What can we do now? What conversations can we have now? What can we do beyond conversations to be anti-racist? What can we do for our city? What nonprofit are you giving to? It's a shameless plug, give it to the Hope Bus. I don't know, but I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> what nonprofit are you giving to? If you're a funder in here, are you giving to the things that make you comfortable or are you giving to the things that are creating real change? If you have resources, are you giving those resources to the people who are walking these streets at night. I'm talking about me, okay? <laughs> yeah, are you giving the resource? And, and, and we have to take care. And lastly, I'm done, Dr. Paul, I promise. The last thing we have got <laughs> to not just be compassionate city because we have it in our name. We have got to care about the most vulnerable population in our society right now, and that is our group of houseless folks. People are on the streets when we have empty buildings and vacant houses. People are on the streets People are in the cold, and then it becomes the responsibility of the grassroots people like me and Dr. Ferguson to care for the people who are victims of a system that was created. And we run all of our resources out 
trying to be caretakers. In our city, all of us have a responsibility. If we want to be anti-racist, if we want to be compassionate, if we want to be real about equity, if we want to be real about justice, all of us have a responsibility to be, to be healers and, and stop trying to be heroes. And that's all I got to say. I think. Mm. Thank you, Ox. Uh, I'm sorry. For I almost stood up. I almost stood up there. Uh, I sat back Watching down. your words. <laughs> to the chase. James, there? I want to offer a, a different perspective mm -hmm. um, because uh, we are in a community, in the Russell community, where we have learned that about $85 million flows yeah. outside of our community annually. When that $85 million leaves, those are tax dollars that mm -hmm. fund our schools, that uh, uh, fund our roads and all of the infrastructure. And uh, that comes as a result of disinvestment in our community. Yep. First, to dismantle racism, we've got to have those who are in power yep. to acknowledge that they helped create the institution of racism. Yep. And until that happens, that's the truth. And, and until that happens, we cannot begin to repair yep. what is broken. Yep. And so that's the first thing. But the other part of it is those who are in power are the ones who are able uh, to make uh, changes in those institutions um, that affect uh, the, the West End of Louisville. Yep. And so we need those power brokers to help us yep. to change, to invest. I think um, in July when we opened our building, I, I think I heard the mayor say that um, that was the first new in, uh, investment yep. west of Jefferson in over 50 years. Mm -hmm. How many communities How many? in Jefferson County only have an investment in 50 years? We opened a restaurant. There are two sit-down restaurants in a community of Russell that has 10,000 plus yeah. residents. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, power brokers yeah. that need to intentionally make an investment in the West End because that is what is going to help to restore our communities. That is what is going to help to change uh, where we can all begin to share in that, um, uh, that, that unity yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and that common goal to, to uh, restore uh, Louisville where we all feel like that we are being treated justly yeah. uh, and and we all uh, want to um, uh, be a part of. Mm -hmm. When we talk about a compassionate city, compassion goes beyond just saying I empathize with you, I yeah. care about you, right. but it I'm means uh, making a tangible investment mm -hmm. in the people uh, within the community. And so we got to be able to tell the truth and admit that we're complicit yes. in mm -hmm. uh, racism. We've got to uh, offer people of color, people from the West End, and those who are underserved a seat at the table so that they can begin to uh, use um, um, their uh, their their uh, stories and their their struggles and um, to to make a difference, yeah. uh, but we also need you to uh, walk alongside of us. Yeah. So many times, uh, money is put in, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Alton. Uh, money is uh, put in, uh, and it's a, a one-time deal. Yeah. This one. You know, but it needs to be a constant flow 
of investment in our yes. community so that we can yes. build black wealth, so that yeah. we can improve our schools, so that we can have the amenities and the resources that others in, our, in uh, Jefferson County has. And those things go a long way with improving the conditions in our city. Yeah. Wow, powerful. Thank you. Thank you, James Edda. Thank you. Powerful. So I am, I am mindful, everyone, of the time. So I, uh, Chandra, I don't know if, if, if I have time for one more question. Uh, we'll do one. I have time? Yes? I think we're getting okay, close. Okay, I'm not hearing. I think we're getting close. Uh, looking at the time. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Well, one I'm, more question? One more. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to pose the question. And I'm going to ask James Zeta and Stachel if you would uh, answer it very, very, very briefly. Very, very okay. quickly. You got it. <laughs> Imagine 10 years from now, the West End is thriving. What is happening? What does repair look like? How did we get there? Very briefly. It means having a grocery store in our community. It, it means having financial institutions other than the pawn shops yeah. for people to go and to, to uh, cash checks. It means having restaurants and schools where uh, people have an opportunity uh, to bring their families and, and get quality education. It means having uh, access to networking and all of those things that everybody else in our community has. And ten, in 10 years, it, it means um, everybody has a piece of the pie that mm. they feel like they uh, are entitled to it, um, not um, just uh, hoping that somebody gives it to them, but that they f generally feel that mm -hmm. they des deserve it mm -hmm. and can mm. get it. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you colleagues. And I turn the floor back over to you who are we didn't get a response from we, we, he, he knew. He oh, stay shell. <laughs> I thought I heard grocery store. Okay. To, to add to that, I'd, I'd just like to see in 10 years our kids playing again. Um, and mm -hmm. I, and I, I like to see, I like Thank to be you. able to go somewhere and have ice cream because we can't go nowhere and have ice cream. That's right. And I like, mm. I like to be able to walk out my door and go get a chili dog. From, from a mom and pop mm. store because the neighborhood is thriving. Actually, right. I would like to, when we drive to the Western Loyal, I'll be like, now you're entering into the city of West Loyal. Mm. Amen. Mm. Mm. Amen. Mm. Amen. 10 years from now, mm. remember I said this. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Ashe, amen, amen. 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 So um, I want to just do a double check here. Are we ready to go with the um, pods? OK, all right, great. So hello again, everybody. Now, you have heard a lot over this time, would you say? Even if you just came today, you've heard a lot. And what we like to do now is to engage you in a way that we engage often at Spalding, Spalding, and that is with other people, talking with people that maybe you don't know, but we're gonna ask you to engage in, uh, a few, with a few questions. And those questions are gonna be coming up here. I have uh, joining me one of our doctoral students, uh, Tracy Smith, and uh, she will be helping out in ways that uh, wherever we need, okay? But what we're going to ask you to do is you're going to get into pods of three, just three. And we're going to invite you to please get into pods with people that you don't know, at least that you don't know everybody in your pod, okay? And um, then we're going to give you the questions. So quickly, get into pods of three.
All right, how are you doing? I see a number of pods already formed and a few more just still forming. So what we're gonna do is engage in um, some brief conversations. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the process we're inviting you to engage in. Um, if you will change that slide, I'd like to have everybody follow along. What we're gonna do is we're gonna be um, involved in what we call sacred spaces and in these sp sacred spaces, these are the kind of spaces where we can invite in each person to participate. Where we bring forward our core self at its best. Where each of us makes visible our interconnectedness. Where we recognize and access the value of every participant, where we elicit individual and collective wisdom and practice valued-based behavior. Okay, now we're gonna be doing this in short order. We usually do this in, with much more time when we do it, but we're gonna do it in short order today. So we're gonna ask that you speak your truth and listen for others' truths. Be honest with others and be considerate and tactful at the same time. Say your piece and leave time for others to say their piece. We're gonna tell you how much time you have. Engage constructively rather than focusing on forces that you cannot influence. This is an important one because that is one of the things we tend to do, point outwardly, and we're gonna ask you not to do that. Um, lean into the discomfort as a learning opportunity. So if you start to feel a little edgy inside, think of that as, okay, I'm growing. I'm growing. Um, uh, honor silence. Now, what we mean by that is when um, a person has spoken in your group, if you will allow a few seconds of silence to really hear what they have said, to allow silence to speak to you, to help you to interpret what they have said. So give about seven to 10 seconds, okay? All right, stay on topic and be present to one another throughout the process. Those are the guidelines. Now, first question, are you all ready to go? We want you to introduce yourself. You're gonna give your name, and in 12 or less words, okay? What, in, that's a big question up here, right? I know you already read it. It's a big question, but we're gonna say 12 or fewer words. Now, let me, I'm gonna give you an example. Here I am, okay? This is mine. Black Southerner of the Jim Crow era, Faith equaled love and active resistance. Okay? That informed my understanding of faith and race. Okay? Now, I know you need a few seconds to think about that. So I'm going to ask that you take a moment in quiet. And just think about your response so that you can listen to others when they are responding. All right, how did that go? Good, I heard somebody up here say good. How about for the rest of you, how did it go? Did you get through the questions? Wonderful, okay. So now we're gonna move to the next one. What is one truth about faith and race that you have heard during this festival, or in life perhaps, that really compels you? And what will you do with this truth? You may begin. All right, our time is up. And I hope that you had um, a meaningful expression and sharing in that question. And the next question will be a follow-up to that one. So you've just talked about what truth was 
poignant enough that it compelled you to want to do something. That truth. And what you are going to do about it. Now, the follow-up question is this. What can get in the way of you taking action? And what will you do with that? Okay, you may begin. All right. Um, thank you for that. And we will now move to our uh, closing. But I'd like to get just a general feel from you all about um, this experience of speaking with others whom you do not know. I see a couple of thumbs up over here. How was it for you? Thumbs up in the back, thumbs up over here, thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay, all around the room I'm seeing thumbs up. Great, great. Now, um, we're going to have a, clo a few closing words from Alton, and then I'm going to have a few closing words for you. And we really mean few this time. <laughs> and um, we will then turn it back over to Sarah, who will be closing us out. And I want to thank you all so much for engaging in this process. Alton. Alton, can you hear us? Thank you, Sandra. Yes. And thank you, everyone, for this exercise that we've just completed. We want to take a moment now to introduce Kamani Bridges, who will come to us with a musical interlude entitled Truth. Let me introduce Kamani to you properly. Kimani Bridges is a flutist and composer currently studying musical composition at Indiana University's Jacobs School of Music. She graduated from DuPont Manual High School where she performed with the symphonic band and chamber ensemble. Her pieces have been performed at the New Works Festival. Kimani participated in the Loreto Project's Pathways Initiative Program and she was named a Next Notes High School Creator Award winner of 2020. Kamani will be premiering three new compositions during the after hours session, including the world premiere of Uplifted with Louisville Orchestra conductor Teddy Abrams and other musical guests. Hear ye now, Imani Bridges and truth.
Thank you, Kamani, and thank you, everyone. My closing remarks are brief. I would simply like to acknowledge in the spirit of the composition that Kimani just shared with us, the truth that was spoken by James Edda Ferguson and Stachelle Bussey, the repair that was exhibited, I do believe, in our collective work and responsibility this morning, co-moderated by my colleague, Chandra Goforth Irvin. And to all of you who are here this day, to always remember and never forget that faith is a verb, as much if not more so than it is a noun. Mm -hmm. That we are called into action to repair the world around us with respect to matters of racism. And what does that repair mean? It means whatever it is that is blocking an individual's or a group's or a communi community's capacity to experience the fullness of the sacred within their being requires from us an active response to remove those impediments. And we have heard much today and I'm so very grateful to have been able to share this time with my colleagues and with those who have convened the Festival of Faiths. And I would ask that each of us, as we leave this session today, that we not only be hearers of the word, but be doers also. Chandra, my thanks to you and to James Etta and to Stachelle and to the Festival of Faith, Sarah and Owsley and Tricia and all. Thank you. Thank you all. And so for my final comments, I'd like to share with you a bit of an experience I had in 2020. Ahmaud Aubrey had just been slain, another dead body. No one was paying attention, at least from my perspective. Everybody seemed to be focused on COVID, but there was another black body. I had spent several decades working and fighting to create better race relations. And it seemed that it had been in vain for me in that moment. I felt like I had had enough. I was not one to easily cry. But that morning, in the hour of my meditation, I could no longer contain my pain. I wailed. And I was ready to be done. But then, I heard my moment of truth one of my moments of truth spoke to me and said, for whose sake are you doing this? I knew it was for the sake of my ancestors, my parents. It was for the sake of my children and the future generations. It was for God's sake but I was still tired. And then I heard, and deep within my spirit, I sensed that I was being told this. You have others who need you. You don't have to engage everyone, but there are others who need you. 
and you need them. I believe that all of you are part of the you. I need you. I need you. And so I want to thank you for being here, for choosing to come today, to share in this experience in the fullness of it. And I want to say to you that your presence is affirming and inspiring, for we all need each other. We all need each other. Not everyone will be ready to join us. Not everyone will come. But those of us who are ready must be there for one another. We must be igniting and fanning the flame of courage that will help us to respond to our moments of truth so that we will be animated to the truth, to grace, and to repair, so that we all might be whole. Again, I want to thank you so much for being you and for daring to be even more as we go forward into the future. Um, I need you, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you so much. And, and I have one final question that I'd like you to go out with. And this is, again, another one of those questions we ask in the anti-racist training we do. And I don't see it coming up, but I will tell you what it is. All right, so it is this, it's fill in the blank. So I'm going to encourage you just to think about this as you depart. I will, and fill in the blank, what you, will you do, okay? I will, blank, for the sake of, fill in the blank, even if I must risk, fill in the blank. So you have three blanks to fill in. I will, ah, for the sake of, even if I must risk. Please give that thought. And thanks again for coming. Really extraordinary. In our early conversations with Minister Chandra and Alton, uh, he said, we're going to get gritty. And I think we've gotten delivered on that. It's been tremendous. Thank you very much. Uh, we're so blessed to have our wisdom keepers here in Louisville. So we will finish up our session with another minute of silence to sit and digest what we've just experienced, and then uh, we'll have some announcements about what's coming up in the future. <laughs>